So now we're back to the beginning of the day. If you remember that Medford Mail Tribune headline up there, um, we are impacted by climate change. There is no reason to think that that's not going to get worse in the coming years. And it's absolutely an exacerbating element in the kind of fire seasons that we are experiencing. I think every panel has referred to climate change in one way or another. It's no longer a debate, it's a fact. And we have to figure out what we can do about it. So our final panel um, will bring us home, and I think what you will hear today is not only a lot of information about climate change, but also the ways in which some of our climate solutions can also serve in a very reinforcing way um, to address the forest issues that we heard back about on the first panel. So I'm going to introduce Sean Franks. He is a 2014 graduate of Southern Oregon University, where he studied business and environmental studies and corporate sustainability. He works for True South Solar, which is a leading local team of designers and installers working in residential and commercial solar power systems. He currently serves on the board of Rural Climate, the McKinsey River Gathering Foundation Grant Making Committee, and the SOU Board of Trustees. Sean. Thank you all for being here this morning. How exciting to kind of get to learn with my community. Live in the sunshine, swim in the sea, drink in the wild air, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Climate, the weather conditions prevailing in an area in general over a long period is changing. Our summers have not been and will not be the summers of our youth. Our fires are burning hotter, faster, and twice as large over the last 30 years. The problem is human caused and will take long-term solutions from us coming together. Imagine with me for just a moment the childhood, um, just the summers of your childhood. What did you do? Where did you go? How much fun did you have? And who were you with? Summer vacation as a child for me meant playing outside, enjoying what the environment had to offer, no school, sleeping outside, playing with friends, catching fish, and breathing deep. I remember uh, growing up, my mother would often say, why don't you go play outside and don't come back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a father to two wonderful boys now, Carter and Micah. They're five and eight years old. And this summer, like many of us, spent most of their summers indoors. They were constantly told, you can't play outside, it's too smoky. And when all of us check the air quality index, hopefully on our apps, or now you know which app to utilize, uh, the air quality index too is telling us essentially you can't play outside, it's too smoky. Our climate is changing and it's having real consequences for our communities. In Arizona, this looks like heat waves. In North and South Carolina, hurricanes and extreme flooding. Right here in Oregon and California, we're looking at water shortages, economic losses, hotter summers, massive fires, and more smoke. These fires, along with the smoke, are undoubtedly changing the way we live in Southern Oregon, and it's hard to imagine these fires getting any worse, but the science is telling us it will. We are here on a Saturday because these fires and smokes are having an actual impact on our lives, and that's pretty scary. And in the face of this, we are here because we care about our community, our future, and our climate. We are coming together to figure out what are the responsible, long-term actions that we need to take to protect our families, our neighbors, and our communities. Despite this new reality, I still have a lot of hope that there are real actions we can take to get back on track. We can keep 80% of the fossil fuels in the ground, we can transition to 100% renewable energy, and we can sequester greenhouse gases in our forests and farms. But by acting now, we can make our community stronger. We can create good jobs and clean energy um, and forest restoration, and we can protect our quality of life here in Southern Oregon. With that, I'd like to introduce Bill Bradbury. Bill Bradbury has served as an Oregon representative to the Northwest Power and Council, Oregon Secretary of State, and State Senator. As the director for the sake of the salmon, he worked collaboratively with the Northwest Native American tribes federal, state, 
and local governments, as well as timber, agriculture, and fishing interests. Bill was one of the first 50 people trained by former Vice President Al Gore to give climate presentations in 2006, and he has delivered over 500 presentations across the state. Yeah. Please join me in welcoming Bill Dawson. So thank you. It's a real, uh, uh, it's a real uh, pleasure uh, to be here. <laughs> Mostly. Um, so uh, thank you so much. I wanted to uh, start this presentation uh, by having everyone look at the uh, screen uh, and uh, look at the change in temperatures. This is all over the world. And uh, the United States is at the bottom center. And watch as time goes on and uh, as it gets uh, redder and redder, you start to realize that, oh, the climate does appear to be changing. And it's particularly striking as you go into the 2000s. And it's just, uh, that's the whole world not just Southern Oregon, not just Oregon, that's the whole world. Oregon right now, or not the Oregon, Oregon's a little hotter, uh, but uh, the United States is now one and a half degrees hotter than it was in uh, 1880. So um, clearly we're seeing a dramatic increase uh, in uh, surface temperature, uh, and uh, 17 of the 18 hottest years on record occurred since the year 2001. Uh, the four hottest years uh, on record are in fact the last four. Four, the last four years, this year and the last four years, or not, the last four years are the four hottest uh, on uh, record. Uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, 2018, um, they had the uh, hottest day uh, in, in, in really in history in Korea, uh, 105, uh, over 105 degrees. Uh, in uh, Algeria, uh, they had uh, uh, really a new uh, all-time heat record for Africa, 124 degrees. Um, uh, and um, There we go. Uh, Pakistan, um, it's uh, basically, uh, they were 122 uh, degrees uh, on uh, April of uh, this year. Uh, in Montreal, Canada, which is a place you normally think of as kind of cool, uh, they had 90 people die in, actually in Quebec uh, in July this year because uh, they had a heat wave and the ambulances were overwhelmed. And in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, 90 people died in mid-May as a result of temperatures in Karachi that rose above 109 degrees. So you're seeing real impacts. So, and you're seeing it all over the world, worldwide uh, weather impacts, is, whether it be extreme temperatures, droughts and fires, and red floods and mudslides, and blue or storms, uh, hurricanes, for example, typhoons, for example, uh, in uh, yellow. Uh, that brings us right here to now. Uh, August of this year, uh, we had uh, uh, in uh, 2018, 859 fires throughout the state of Oregon. Uh, 70,000 acres burned so far. Uh, and uh, we're seeing it all over the country, Durango, Colorado. The 416 fire burned over 33,000 acres. The, uh, uh, the buzzard fire burned over 50,000 acres in uh, New Mexico. And I, it's not really a big surprise, but hotter years typically have more fires. You can see here from this chart, as the temperature goes up, the fires increase. That's looking at the last 45 years. Um, um, the um, uh, Fire season in the U.S. West is now 105 days longer than it was in 1970. Uh, and um, 
Um, obviously, we had a, a series of wildfires in uh, Northern California and in uh, Southern Oregon. Um, the, uh, uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor for Oregon uh, showed that it was 100% abnormally dry uh, throughout the state. 84% of the state has been suffering from severe drought. Uh, and this is just some aerials of uh, the fires, and this is what it looked like, and I'm sure you all remember. There were over 2,000 firefighters fighting uh, the fires. Um, and not surprisingly, the water supply in the Rogue and Umpqua basins was 76% of normal uh, this uh, year. And um, in Oregon, uh, the average, 10-year average of the number of acres that are burned is about 33,000 acres. Uh, in 2018, we had 71,000 acres burned. So we are twice uh, the 10-year uh, uh, average in terms of burning. So that's true all over this country. Um, you can see wildfires consuming uh, more U.S. land. Uh, if you look from uh, 1983 to the present, it's basically way more than doubled the amount of land that's being burned by wildfires. So uh, it's not surprising as temperatures increase, uh, you see uh, more and more moisture being evaporated into the sky and warmer air can hold a lot more uh, water vapor, and with each additional one degree centigrade of temperature, uh, the atmosphere's, atmos atmosphere's capacity to hold water vapor increases by 7%. So more water is held in the sky. There's already 5% more water vapor over the ocean than there was only 30 years ago. So what does that mean? Well, in addition to drying, what it means is we get downpours getting bigger and bigger. Uh, this is a, 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 a rain bomb in um, Montana in 2010. Uh, this is in Wichita, Kansas this year. Uh, and uh, this is Phoenix, Arizona in 2016. Uh, and watch the water fall out of the sky in this 2015 photograph of a rain bomb in, Fien or in Tucson. Just lands on there, just lands. It's just phenomenal. There's just huge amounts of water coming out of the sky. So globally, floods and extreme rainfall uh, now occur four times more often than in 1980. And uh, basically, uh, it, all over the country, Quincy, Massachusetts, Rockford, Illinois, uh, Ellicott City, uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland, Louisville, uh, Kentucky, uh, in France, uh, and Somalia, uh, and uh, Kenya. 150 people died in Kenya, and uh, 222,000 have been displaced since March by torrential rains. Uh, flooding and a burst dam. Uh, this is Sichuan province in China, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of people were killed by flooding in China uh, this year, uh, and that's what it looks like, just studying and looking at all the flood water. Hmm. So pretty incredible. Uh, this was in uh, uh, Japan, uh, and uh, about 200 uh, people uh, were killed by flooding. Uh, in, uh, in this part of Japan. Uh, you just get to wait on your roof till you get uh, rescued. Uh, and basically some parts of Japan re received uh, 40 inches of rain uh, in 48 hours. 40 inches of rain in 48 hours. Uh, this is a picture of Hiroshima, Japan. We can all remember Hiroshima from World War II. Uh, they suffered from a rain bomb this time. Uh, it's, it's pretty pretty remarkable. Uh, and it's, there are other events. Uh, in, uh, in Argentina, uh, a, a rain bomb delivered uh, about uh, 4.9, almost 5 feet of uh, uh, hail uh, in Ar Argentina. 
So I want to just emphasize the same water that evaporates more water from the ocean, uh, causing bigger downpours and floods, that water also uh, pulls more moisture even more quickly from the soil, causing longer droughts and, uh, and fires. Uh, this is in uh, South Africa. This is a water reservoir there. They're not doing too well. Uh, uh, this is in Zimbabwe, uh, trying to get some water out of a well. Uh, and uh, this is in uh, China. And this used to be water. This used to be a river. You can see the bridge. But it's not there anymore. Um, and we all heard, remember the uh, uh, fires in Greece. Uh, 91 people were killed in fires near uh, Athens. Uh, I actually just love this photograph. It's a photograph of a, a fire in, uh, in England uh, with the full moon rising uh, behind it. Uh, but the point is, uh, whether it be Croatia uh, or uh, France uh, or uh, uh, Italy uh, or uh, in Portugal, uh, people died in uh, wildfires that had a dramatic effect. Uh, and it's all the way to India as well. So I think all of you living here are familiar with this picture. Uh, and um, we all know uh, that that's what you see fires and you also see, uh, see smoke. And this is kind of what we're learning to live with is this kind of uh, smoke. Uh, and it has a dramatic impact, and clearly there is a cost to everything we're doing, uh, whether it be uh, uh, the political instability or the droughts or the storm damage, uh, et cetera. All these things have a real impact on uh, our life uh, here. And so it's really the cost of carbon in the atmosphere is really the number one threat to the economy. And it's a challenge for all of us to live through it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, now I'd like to introduce Kayla Swanson. Um, Kayla Swanson is Oregon Program Director for Pacific Forest Trust a forest conservation and land trust organization that works in partnership with private landowners, um, communities, and government agencies to sustain forests for their many public benefits. Her recent work as conservation programs director for the Freshwater Trust was focused on developing investment strategies and systems to increase the pace and scale of freshwater conservation. Kayla holds a master's degree in environmental management. Kayla Swanson. Thanks so much for having me. This has been an incredible morning, and I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation on behalf of Pacific Forest Trust. That was an incredible presentation, Bill. Thank you for that. Um, as, as have all of the, the panelists today, um, they've all been great presentations. And some of these problems can feel, I mean, this is a huge problem, and it can feel uh, very hard to do anything about it. But I hope that I can offer a little bit of optimism with a solution that we can apply locally, that we are applying locally here in Oregon and in California and in Washington, but they could certainly be expanded to many other parts of the country and the world. Um, but first I'll tell you a little bit about the Pacific Forest Trust. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are uh, based in California, but as I just said, we work across the West Coast. Um, and we're really focused on protecting forests for all of the benefits that they provide, both for the economic benefits and for the benefits to wildlife, water, and the, and, um, the climate, specifically in this context. Um, so we've been around for about more than 25 years, and we've protected more than 265,000 acres of forest land. And we'd like to see more of that. And so we're also engaged in policy conversations to try to find uh, ways to drive more revenue and more funding toward natural and working lands and forests in particular. Um, and the reason that we want to do that is that forests, you know, globally, forest loss and degradation is the second largest source of um, carbon dioxide emissions. However, forests also have the potential to sequester far more than they emit, so they're really um, a, a, an opportunity for us and a reason to have some optimism and hope as, as we move forward. 
Um, and there's three, three things, very simple, that we want to see with forest land. We want to reduce forest loss in general. We want to stop it from happening in the first place. We want to increase the resiliency of our current forests to bring them back to their natural states and to increase their health and complexity. And then we also um, we want to reforest areas that have been historically, that were historically forested that may be um, converted or that maybe are so degraded that they're really not functioning as forests anymore. So pretty, pretty simple solutions if you, if you kind of boil it down that way. Um, and we think that we have some tools and some ideas about how we might do this. And one is called a working forest conservation easement. And so that's what I'll be talking about primarily today. Um, and I'll go into detail about that a little bit more. In general, a working forest conservation easement accomplishes two of these big goals, which is keeping forests as forests and um, increasing the carbon richness of forests, so sequestering more carbon. Um, it also has additional benefits um, of increasing climate resiliency and fire resiliency. So. Um, I'll just, I guess, jump into what a working forest conservation easement might look like on the ground. Um, it's important to note that working forest easements are still in forestry. They are still being timbered, they're still being logged. Um, but we're also working with pu public and private um, investments to leverage um, those private landowners' lands so that we are seeing the public benefits increasingly generated. So uh, Pacific Forest Trust really works with um, private forest owners whether they are um, individual landowners or large um, timber investment management uh, companies, just that, that whole spectrum. And, and public lands do this work as well. We heard about that earlier today. So this is a tool sort of in that um, sweet spot in the middle. Um, and it's very cost effective investment. We can make, it generates rural jobs. It also benefits the climate and um, is good for the habitat. So what is an easement? It might be a question that you have. An easement is pretty simply just a legally binding agreement not to um, do something on your land. And when we're talking about conservation easements, they're usually used to protect land from being converted or from being subdivided. And if you're looking at forest land, we add another layer to that where a working forest easement also says, let's manage this land um, in consistency with certain values. And those values are going to be described by the landowner. Every property is different. All the outcomes are, um, um, we're always working for outcomes that are beneficial for wildlife and for climate and for water, but um, how you prioritize those actions and exactly where on your property you're going to do that is going to change over time because easements are, um, they're permanent. They are, they travel with the land no matter who owns it. Once an easement is in place, it's forever. So you're going to have to manage that adaptively over time for those same outcomes. But um, that's what we do and I'd like to give you a couple of examples uh, just here at home that might be of interest to you. The first is actually just down the road. I'm not sure if Judd Parsons is here in the room or if any of you know him, but he's a member of your community and this property is just um, a fantastic member of the community, I should say. He's an incredible guy if you haven't met him. And uh, his property is also uh, very unique, um, both for its location and because of where you all are in general. So his property is in between uh, land that's managed by the uh, Forest Service and land that's managed by the BLM, making it a pretty important piece of connectivity. Um, it's also in an area, you guys have some of the most incredible biodiversity in the world. You have so many rare and endangered species, Pacific fish ooze, you have, um, you know, the northern spotted owl, uh, coho salmon. This property is also at the headwaters of Neal Creek. So lots of reasons that we thought working with Judd would be an incredible opportunity. And Judd has already been um, managing this land uh, for more than 100 years, his family has been managing this property, and he wants to see that management continue. He has values in place that he wants to protect, um, water, wildlife. Um, he's managing for fire risk reduction. There's a very steep slope where he's um, managing primarily to prevent any fire you know, moving across the crest because that would be devastating if it were to occur. Um, he's also got areas where he's managing primarily for an economic return, and we wanted to help him protect this legacy uh, moving forward. Um, also, because it's really valuable for the climate. He has a very healthy forest. It's a very diverse forest. There's a multi-storied canopy. He has um, different habitat areas. He has oak regeneration and he has a wet meadow. Lots of things that are happening there um, that are good for uh, preventing carbon loss in the first place and also for the net carbon on the ground and in the wood products when he's harvesting. That's still um, carbon sequestration. It's only about a third as effective as a, a standing tree, but that's something that is a renewable resource that we can see a lot more of moving forward. Um, Judd's property is also a really interesting example of uh, funding streams because we worked with, um, with him and with um, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board 
um, the U.S. Forest Service as well as the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to fund this, this conservation easement. Um, so it's a nice way to see how public and private dollars can be leveraged and also to just take this opportunity to say that funding these things is not easy and there are not very many opportunities in this state uh, to do that. So moving down the road, we could take a little bit of um, a lesson from our neighbors in California where the climate legislation has really led to a lot of funding for forest health and forest conservation. And so that's something that we think moving forward in Oregon, a climate, a climate bill would, would help us to see more of. Um, so this property is um, a little bit further down I-5 in between the cities of Mount Shasta City and Weed, California. And um, those are both growing, growing cities, a lot of incredible outdoor recreation, a lot of potential fire risk. So we worked with um, a company called Michigan California Timber Company uh, to look at how they might move 5,000 of their 40,000 acres into more um, heterogeneous, complex forest management. They typically have even age trees that are much more dense, like a lot of what we heard about earlier today, and they're interested in seeing what they could do and what kinds of practices would help them uh, move into a more you know, multi-story diverse canopy. And this property, um, we haven't actually finalized this easement, this is something that is in process, but I think it's a really exciting one because it's entirely funded by money, as I said, from the sale of greenhouse gas allowances or permits in the state of California. So um, the scale of this is pretty significant, working with this company is pretty significant, and we think um, you know, it's a really great step forward that we'd like to see more of um, in California and in Oregon. Um, it's also a place where, again, we're still doing logging, we're still selling wood products, and we're seeing a lot more carbon richness and a lot more uh, species diversity moving forward. So really a win-win, and we think it's a pretty versatile tool. Um, this is just, I'll just, I wanted to reemphasize the versatility of this tool with this slide, but this is also a, a property that we work on um, in Lincoln County, uh, Oregon, called our called the Van Eck Forest, and it's um, really under natural forest management, which is a slightly different approach. Um, but all of these represent sort of a, a spectrum of land ownership and different outcomes that people want to see, different kinds of um, approaches, but it's, it's fairly simple. Forests have an enormous opportunity to sequester carbon. Oregon is more than one-third forest land. Mm -hmm. We should take this opportunity to really lead um, our country and you know, globally in uh, addressing climate change and also with that bringing more resiliency to fire, which I think is something everyone in this room is very interested to see. I didn't have a lot of time today, but if you'd like to talk more, this is my email address, and I left some um, pamphlets over on the table. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kayla. Um, this today, thank you all for joining us today. This was absolutely not the end of the conversation. As you can see, we haven't solved the issue quite yet, but I think us being together as a community uh, is really a great starting point. So thank you all for your engagement and your future action. Just a couple of other comments. First, uh, again, thanks to the phenomenal panelists and moderators that we have here today. Uh, again, the link to the video to presentation will be on my Facebook page, Rep. Pam Marsh. If you can't find it, get in touch with me, and I, I will make sure that you have it. It will also be shown in at times to, to be announced um, on RBTV for those of you who received that. It was an incredible three hours, but of course in three hours we can't cover everything and, and it's clear there will be many opportunities in the months to come for more discussion, more thinking on all of this. I'm already thinking about a town hall presentation with the state fire marshal to get him to come down here and talk about how we use data to predict fire and to organize the resources around that. So stay tuned, we'll, we're going to be putting that together in the next couple of months as soon as we can get away from fire season. Um, but I do have two requests. One is if you would like to be informed of future events, please leave us your email on those sign-in sheets. You may have signed in when you came in. If you did, you're already taken care of. If not, and you'd like to be informed, please sign up. We won't use your email or anything else, I promise. And secondly, we have a feedback form that's over on the back table. Paige has got it. Um, no requirement to fill it out, but if you have suggestions for future forums or comments, on our time here this morning, please leave those on that form. We may be in touch with you over email um, to offer you the chance to do that as well in the coming weeks. Um, and finally, take a few minutes. We have this room till one o'clock. 
Um, there's some great resources around the room, have the opportunity sh to share with each other. Nature Conservancy is doing a fire history tour at 2 o'clock this afternoon. If anybody's still got energy after sitting in this room with us for three hours, um, you can see them in the back. And again, my heartfelt thanks to all of you for coming today. Thank you.